Good afternoon. Thank you so much for being with us tonight or this afternoon. Every Wednesday is important and special, but tonight is extra important and extra special for a few reasons. Tonight is our 100th anniversary. It's our 100th America at a Crossroads program. What started out two years ago is what we thought would be a couple weeks of COVID, COVID quarantine programming has become so much more than that. One of our very few, one of the very few positive unintended consequences of the horrific pandemic, which globally has claimed 6.19 million lives is this program each week. Tonight is also important and special because we are about to hear from three amazing, brilliant journalists on the critically important topic, trust in journalism. Thanks, thank you to all of our guests, Judy Woodruff, Marty Barron, and Jeffrey Cowan. We look forward to hearing from you. And finally, tonight is special and important because in two days, Passover starts. And this is not just any Passover. It is a Passover with an overlay of COVID and of the war in Ukraine. Reliable studies tell us that whereas only around a quarter of American Jews claim to engage in religious observance, more than 75% claim to attend a Seder. And in Israel, the numbers are even more dramatic where secular Jews claim to disregard almost every religious practice, they do so religiously, but 93% of Israelis attend a Seder. So why does Passover win the Jewish popularity contest and even attract a fair number of non-Jews who like to attend Seders? Well, I don't know the empirical answer, but here are some of my thoughts. An obvious answer is that Passover is the essence of the story of the Jewish people. The celebration of the transition from isolation, despair, and slavery to freedom, independence, and autonomy. But Passover can additionally be understood as a universal story of personal, communal, and global liberation and humanity. This year, we are especially mindful of the horrors confronting the Ukrainian people, a people who Putin tried to enslave, but who rebelled and are now struggling with a harrowing journey to liberation and independence. We are also aware of those who were enslaved by COVID and now on their journey to recovery or to freeing themselves from their grief of loss or to finding new freedom and being able to be in community with other people. The Passover story starts when Moses left the comfort and safety of the palace and actually saw the suffering of the slaves. He recognized the injustice and then did the work which inspired the exodus from Egypt. In the context of our democracy work at Judge and America at a Crossroads, Passover affords us the opportunity to inspire others to see the bondage of voter suppression, of xenophobia, of racism, of anti-Semitism. And the fact that we, like Moses, need to do the work which inspires and sustains our democracy. So here are two little things that each of us can do for Passover. You can chip in to help the Ukrainians through any of the projects that we have mentioned on our various emails, including the one that we have one of our judge lis listeners, one of our America to Crossroads listeners issued a challenge, a 25% challenge to those who donated to any one of three projects that are mentioned in our emails or any other program that you would like to donate to. You can also engage in our democracy. You can help to register voters and fight against complacency. If you don't like the way it's going, find something to do about it. And I know most people who listen to our program are not satisfied with the way things are going. So there are things you can do. Our website gives lots of options for volunteer work. So I wanna wish those who celebrate and even those who don't happy Passover. And now David will tell you about some of our upcoming programs and we'll introduce tonight's moderator. David. Thank you, Janice, for those uh, stirring remarks. If the crisis in Ukraine and geopolitical tensions are what concern you, America to Crossroads is the place to be for the next several weeks. On April 20th, next Wednesday, we'll host a return visit of Lieutenant Colonel Alex Vindman, the National Security Council Russia expert who blew the whistle on Trump's undermining of Ukraine. In three weeks, we will again host the former chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Admiral Mike Mullen, followed by Leon Panetta, the former head of the CIA and a former Secretary of Defense. Both Mullen and Panetta will address how experts view a topsy-turvy world. In two weeks, we'll catch up on the other headline topic of the year, Trump and the law. We'll host the brilliant Neil Katyal, a former Solicitor General of the United States, along with Pulitzer Prize-winning Washington Post journalist and former employee of Martin Barron, Carol Lanig, to discuss the legal perils that the ex-president faces. Tonight's topic, Trust in Journalism, will be moderated by Jeff Cowan, an expert on the media from both a practitioner's and an academic's perspective. He's a lawyer, best-selling author, and Emmy Award-winning producer, in addition to having been the dean of the Annenberg School of Communication at USC. 
He also served as the head of the Voice of America under President Clinton, a position his father held 50 years earlier under FDR. He's the perfect host for tonight's topic. Jeff, it's all yours. Thank you, David, and thank you, Janice. Let me just congratulate you on this 100th anniversary, your 100th program, uh, and Mel and Zev, what, what, you started something really quite remarkable, and you, you see all these people all around the country who are part of it, and so congratulations to you. I'm really delighted to have the chance to introduce and have a conversation with two of America's truly great journalists. Judy Rodriff, of course, is the anchor and managing editor of the PBS NewsHour, which many people uh, on this call tonight watch every evening. And many people consider you, Judy, to be the gold standard for broadcasting. And so thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, and you won countless awards for your journalism. And today you won another one or were nominated. You're, you and your show were, I think, for eight or something Peabody Award, just nominated today, just again, as part a typical day, day for you. Uh, so thanks for being with us. And Marty Barron, uh, of course, one of the great newspaper editors, he informed us a little earlier that he spent more time at the LA Times than any other publication. I guess it's going to be hard to catch up with that, Marty. But of course, a lot of people know you from your years at the Boston Globe and the movie Spotlight, where Lee Schreiber played your the role of you. And of course, from your years as executive editor of the Washington Post, which just ended just about a year ago, where you won a series of Pulitzer Prizes uh, in an incredibly important area. Uh, era. So thank you. Thank you, Marty, so much for being part of this. Um, I think you two and the most people watching realize that there are many ways in which the news media is in crisis, but one of the ones that's most significant, only one, there are others, uh, is the lack of trust in journalism and the fact that it's declining. There's a Gallup poll that came out uh, last fall, which talked, which said that something only like only 36% of Americans either have a lot of trust or some trust uh, in the media. And so I'd like to start off by asking each of you, starting with Judy, the question of why the trust in the media has been declining um, and whether and why it matters. Judy? Thank you, uh, Jeff. I'm, I'm really honored to be with you. Um, and you know, given what we just heard about your storied career and life, um, I think we're all privileged to be engaged in this conversation. And I'm honored as always to be with Marty Barron, someone I respect enormously, uh, Marty, uh, given your, your extraordinary career. Just very glad to be here with all of you tonight. Um, the trust in journalism, it's something I think that waxed and waned to some extent over the years, but you're right. We've seen it in, in my estimation plummet uh, in, in the last few years. And I think it happened uh, at the same time we had a political leader in this country who was constantly uh, talking about fake news, referring to most of what the press was reporting, um, that was just straight reporting, reporting from what we call the mainstream news, me news media, calling it fake and, and also calling us enemies of the American people. Um, I think the press is accustomed to, to not being everybody's favorite friend. Um, and that was never, that's never been the reason any of us go into this business or it shouldn't be. But the different thing now is that people in power, and a lot of them, uh, have, have uh, just beat the drum steadily uh, that the press is not reporting the news uh, that, that they believe, and therefore they are casting the press as um, enemies on the other side, untrustworthy, unbelievable, uh, not about the facts. And so I think a lot of damage has been done I think we're going to be talking about it tonight, I know, but I think a lot of damage has been done, and I think we've got a lot of work to do uh, to repair that damage. And Judy, why, and I'm going to get to Marty next, why does it matter? To me, it matters because um, a, a press that the public has trust in is part of the foundation of our democracy. Um, everybody's familiar with the First Amendment uh, to the Constitution, which refers to um, various uh, rights. And one of them is, uh, is freedom of the press. And uh, the fact that, <laughs> that the press is now not seen as an honest broker, if you will, an institution that is here to report factually and truthfully about what's going on 
uh, that, that so many Americans, a large percentage, maybe more than half, it depends on which poll you look at, uh, think the press is in effect on the take, uh, that we're not here to do the job that we're supposed to do. Um, I think it, it, it gets at the very heart of our democracy. And, and uh, I, that's why I think it's so crucial that we do everything we can to rebuild that trust. Marty, what would you say? Why, why has this happened and, and, and why does it matter? Well, I think it's a long running trend. Uh, the decline in trust in the press has gone on for a very, very long time. Um, it accelerated during Trump, but it predated Trump for sure. And it, I think it comes within the context of a decline in trust in virtually all American institutions. Uh, you see that, uh, that that too has accelerated uh, decline in trust in the presidency, decline in, decline in trust in Congress, decline in trust in business, in uh, organized religion, um, actually a decline in trust that was uh, during the pandemic, decline in trust in scientists and medical, medical scientists uh, whose levels are lower today than they were pre-pandemic. So um, I think a lot of that has to do with uh, the growth of the internet, uh, the proliferation of media outlets, the ability of people to sort of find a media outlet uh, that uh, affirms their pre-existing point of view. People love to be told that they're right. Um, and uh, and uh, they gravitate to those, those sites. In addition, uh, there is, uh, for many media outlets, there is commercial um, uh, advantage and money to be made in, um, in, in exploiting the polarization that exists in this, in this country. And so this becomes sort of a self-reinforcing cycle. I think it matters because I think in order to have a democracy, you have to have, um, you know, in a democracy, we should be debating policies. Uh, that's part of democracy. That's what makes this country uh, special. That's why people in other parts of the world have traditionally looked up to this country as a place where you can debate ideas freely. Uh, but you still have to have a common set of facts, uh, and uh, you have to share those those facts. Uh, and today, uh, we don't share a common set of facts. We can't even agree on what constitutes a fact, what the elements of a fact are. Uh, the, uh, traditionally, the things that define what a fact is are you look to the basic elements are education, expertise, experience, and most importantly, evidence. And every single one of those things has been uh, dismissed and devalued. Um, and that is a threat to democracy as we have known it. You know, you mentioned scientists are, are among those who people have less faith in. And there's a study recently that, see, that says that your belief in science is the single thing that affects it most is what news outlet you watch. And, yep. and Fox viewers have something like 16% uh, faith in, in, uh, in science. And people who are viewers, Judy of yours probably, are more in the 70% range. A fascinating uh, uh, shift. That's, ab that's absolutely true. The, the level of trust among Republicans today in uh, scientists and, medic and medical scientists is somewhere around, uh, I was looking at a Pew study recently, um, and it's about 17%. A great deal of trust for a but great. Let me be, be a little, and uh, this is supposed to be sort of a, con you know, we want to be uh, bring out some a uh, little bit of controversy here. Um, is any of the distrust of the media, and let's say here we're talking more or less the kind of media you two were so important. Well, Judy still is, and Marty has been. Is any of that distrust fair? Well, there's no question that we make mistakes. I mean, we're human. We try our darndest. <laughs> not to make mistakes. We try to get you know, all parts of a story that matter correct and included in the story. But um, you know, what journalism is about is we can't tell you everything that's going on in the world. We're picking and choosing and making judgment calls every day about the things that matter, the things that, that are above the cut, above the fold, if you will, that make it into the newscast in our case, uh, and the things that don't. So those judgment calls fall on our shoulders. They depend on the collective uh, experience and judgment of the journalists who are making that decision. That's true at the news hour. It's true at every news organization. And sometimes we get it wrong. Um, do I think that we deserve the level of distrust that I see out there right now? No, I think, sure, there are news organizations parading as <laughs> news organizations that are mainly about opinion, that are not about reporting. Um, and one of the problems, and this gets back to something Marty said, is you've got opinion coming from all directions, and 
the public is asked to decide. They've got a bigger burden on, uh, on them to understand what are some sources that I can trust and what are sources that I really have to be careful about or shouldn't trust, at, excuse me, at all. And so when you think about that and you think about uh, the, the sources or the news quote, quote unquote news organizations that are putting information out that isn't vetted, isn't, tr isn't accurate, isn't true, that is contributing uh, to, to, uh, to this overall lack of, of trust. Um, and so to some extent, some of us who are in the, well, I keep coming back to the term mainstream media, I wish there were a better term, better name for it. Sometimes I feel like we're fish swimming in a stream somewhere, but, but um, that's why it's, you know, we've got, a, we've got a tough job to do. We've got to figure out how to um, be believable, be trustworthy. At the same time, people are looking at dozens and dozens of sources of news, many of which are not on the level. Um, undoubtedly, cable news has had something to do with this, which tends to be more of an entertainment outlet and so forth than things used to be. You and I are old enough to remember the Fairness Doctrine, which had a certain effect on the news media. But let me ask this of maybe of Marty. We have a question from Larry that uh, is in tune with what I was going to ask next, which is there's a historical element of journalism that was partisan. I mean, we've, we've lived in a period when it was more bipartisan, let's say, or down the middle in a sense. But the earliest days of the Republic, the, the press was associated with political parties and pamphleteers and so forth. Oh, absolutely. Um, I think this uh, period where we thought of the press as nonpartisan is a relatively brief period in the history of the United States. If you go back to the founding of the country, you basically had a, bump, a bunch of pamphleteers who were highly ideological. Um, and, uh, and then, of course, you had owners of uh, news organizations. Um, you know, example would be Hearst, William Randolph Hearst, who had clear ideologies uh, that they were promoting. And, um, and so, you know, there was a period where, particularly when there were only three major networks in this country, where media were trying to appeal to sort of a large mass audience. And, um, and, um, and that led to a certain, kind of, a certain kind of journalism, in a way somewhat homogenized. Um, and uh, then with the development of cable, with the development of the internet, uh, with the proliferation of high-speed broadband connections, um, and the emergence of hundreds, thousands of uh, media outlets of one sort or another, uh, that, that changes it. We're kind of going back to the era of the pamphleteers. Uh, the difference is, is that people, these pamphleteers have access to the internet, which means that their messages are available instantaneously and uh, everywhere. Um, and that means they can have more, much more of an impact. So I, in many ways, I think we're reverting back to the kind of press that we had at the beginning of the country, but with a lot more power behind it. Judy, how do they affect you? You've got a major public uh, uh, news operation, hugely respected by at least the world that we're a part of. Um, but do you get a lot of pushback, a lot of criticism, a lot of attacks, either from viewers or from political partisans and so on? Well, sure. I mean, that comes, it's part, it comes with the turf. I mean, if you're a reporter, if you're a news organization, you're going to get, you're going to get pushback. I mean, what's, heartening to me is we're still getting pushback from both ends of the political spectrum. We get people who will write in and say, we think you're too sympathetic uh, to Republicans and others on the same story or the same night will write in and say, we think you're too sympathetic to Democrats and, and many, many, many iterations of that. Um, so uh, sure, I mean, I'm, it, it comes with the territory. I'm used to it. I'm, it used to be I, people would write a letter <laughs> Sometimes they would call. Today, they send an email or they tweet. And if you want to take the time to read all the Twitter comments, um, you could spend the whole the whole day and into the next day and night reading critical. Uh, some of it, some of it praising, and some of it critical. Um, but you know, my view has always been it's important to look at that, but not to let it drive what you're doing. Um, I mean, we understand. I think that our mission is to report the things that we think the public needs to know about. We don't want to live in a vacuum. We want to be responsive. If people, if we've got a flood of people writing in saying, why aren't you covering the environment more? Then we're going to go back and take a look and say, okay, maybe we need to take another look at that. But, 
but uh, not to the extent that we're every day we're going to jerk back and forth based on what on what uh, what people said they liked or didn't like. Um, we pay attention to it, but we're not we're not going to. One thing that may be a little bit new, you were a founder of a tremendous organization that I, I would urge viewers who don't know about it to support at the International Women's Media Fund, which is a great organization. But one of the things the IWMF does is it helps to protect women around the world who are journalists, and it's not only women, but they focus on women who are the subject of threats and harassment. And I'd love to know from both of you whether this anger at the press is manifesting itself in a, in a kind of behavior that's not just an angry tweet or letter, but it's something else. Marty, did you have that experience at all at the, at the Post? You certainly saw what happened at the uh, Annapolis paper where, where several journalists were killed. Yeah, uh, that was a little different, but um, certainly uh, terrible consequences there. Uh, there was an aggrieved individual and that's what you worry about all the time uh, is that some, it just takes one person to do enormous damage. Uh, yes, absolutely. Um, I've been the subject of threats, uh, and it wasn't the worst of it. The people on the staff of the Post endured a lot worse than I did. Uh, there were threats that came through emails, threats by phone calls, uh, threats uh, on uh, the on on Twitter, uh, but also threats at people's homes, uh, people being followed, uh, various uh, incidents that I shouldn't get into here uh, that occurred that indicated that people knew where we lived uh, and that damage could be done. Uh, physical harm could be, could be, um, uh, could, could take place. And so uh, I think that's become a common occurrence. Uh, we had at the Post to, as I think all media outlets have, have done, uh, I'm sure PBS has done the same, uh, is just increase the amount of uh, security that's available to uh, staffers. Um, a lot of background checks on the people who are threatening uh, threatening us, um, and um, uh, it's you know security at the security at the headquarters, security of people's homes, um, uh, all that sort of thing. Uh, Judy, so what's your experience with it, and what's the PBS experience with that? Um, well, just that everything Marty said. Um, I mean, we don't have as large a staff as the Washington Post had, and I'm sorry, I'm getting messages that my internet connections unstable so I hope I, I hope I don't we don't disappear but um, it, sure I mean their threats are there I do think I mean Marty's right it, it it comes it just comes with the territory I do think around the world women journalists have in in many instances faced worse um, uh, kinds of intimidation threats based on, and a lot of it is, is cultural. It depends on the country they've been, they're reporting in. And it's one of the reasons I'm so proud of the work the International Women's Media Foundation has done to try to uh, help put, put some support systems in place, trainings and other things to help keep journalists safe. Uh, because increasingly journalists are targeted around the world. We've seen it, the number of uh, journalists who have died in the line of of duty in, the, in, in reporting a story, uh, reporting from places that are not safe, either because the government doesn't protect them or because they're targeted for some other reason. Um, we've seen it in Mexico, we've seen it in the Philippines, we've seen it around the world, journalists jailed uh, by governments, Turkey, um, and, and the list goes on, not to mention the countries where there is no freedom of the press. So. Um, in countries that where we're lucky enough to have a relatively free press, and in this country, uh, we're at the upper end of the scale, um, but we certainly still have our challenges. Um, there's no question, people feel freer. I mean, think about political rallies today. People feel freer to target reporters than at any time in my career. Marty's right. I mean, there's been controversy about the press for a long time, but some of it just feels more visceral to me. Than it, than it has at any time since I've been a reporter. One of the questions that we've got here from Barry is uh, whether the mainstream media had suppressed the Hunter Biden laptop story. Uh, the, the Post, uh, as you well know, Marty, just did, I think, three pages of an extensive research uh, story, which seems to validate uh, a chunk of it. Uh, could you talk about that at all? And, and is it the sort of thing that you think uh, breeds anger. Now, of course, we know there are plenty of things like that, as Judy says, um, where, where that's happened 
uh, on the other side of the spectrum too, but could you describe oh, okay. Sure, I mean, does it breed, breed anger? Sure, a lot of things breed anger these days, but a lot of people also don't know the facts. So, um, I mean, that the information on that laptop or the what was presented as information from the laptop was in the possession of uh, Giuliani and, uh, and uh, Steve Bannon, uh, as I recall. And, um, and we asked to get access to the, the hard drive and look at it for ourselves so that we could authenticate it. And we were told at the time, you can look at what's on our screen. Well, that's just not good enough, uh, especially a month before an election. Uh, we need to do, we, we have to go through a process of verification, authentication, all of that sort of stuff. Um, and uh, we asked to do so. Uh, we were doing, we did what we normally do is give us the, the basic information, give us the, you know, the, the stuff that we need in order to verify it and to authenticate it, and we'll go do our job. Uh, and we were denied that at the time. And so more recently, uh, they have turned it over. Uh, this was subsequent to my retirement. Uh, and the Post has done a good job of t looking at that. It authenticated some of it. It couldn't authenticate other parts of it. It wrote about the parts that it could authenticate. It did a tremendous amount of work. I'm sure it took an enormous amount of time and an enormous amount of research. Um, that is hard to do uh, when you're, you have several weeks left before an election. And you have to ask yourself, well, why is that being presented to you? As a journalist, you have to ask yourself, why am I getting this just before the election and, and somebody is not giving me full access to the information I need in order to verify and authenticate it? Judy, any comments on that story? Well, just that, um, I mean, as Marty said, the, the sourcing on it has been very difficult. There was just a little bit of information that came out initially, and a whole lot of accusations were made based on a very little bit of information. The press was not allowed to examine the laptop, and we had to question the possession of it. I guess a number of copies were made and so forth. I mean, the bottom line is that I think we should report on that as we do on um, stories that, you know, related stories. Um, there's still work to be done. There's still a lot of questions around that. Um, I salute the Washington Post for the work they've done. I have no doubt, as Marty said, that a lot of time and effort <laughs> went into um, going over what was there, understanding it, figuring out what could be verified and what couldn't, and going to outside experts uh, to help uh, retrieve that information. There's a lot of work involved. I would point out that the Justice Department uh, has been looking at this for uh, over a year now. Uh, it's ongoing, an ongoing investigation. So it does take time. Uh, a, a part of the problem with the, the, the press, that the press is struggling with right now, I shouldn't say problem, but it's a huge problem for the press, is the economics of the industry. And, you know, you're both, you, you know, you fortunately, Marty, had a supporter who was able to, had some deep pockets. Um, due to you and a lot of supporters, I've looked sometimes at that scroll of supporters that you have for the news hour, and there are a lot of them. Uh, hey, if you if you send in uh, a check, uh, we will send you a tote bag uh, and maybe a baseball cap. So, and you have like four thousand viewers now. You can ask ask them to, to support you, but um, or maybe more. But but we've we now are in an era of news deserts, and I'm not sure that. The people on this call really know that, and maybe one of you could talk a bit about what that's a sense of the, of the scope of the news deserts and why that matters so much. Well, I'll just take a, an initial stab at it. Um, what we've seen, as you say, that the economics of journalism has just taken a, a body blow. It, it you know, on the internet had a lot to do with that. Um, once people figured out they could get news for free, why should they? pay for it. Uh, and that's uh, the, the, the institutions that have suffered the most have been the small newspapers around the country that have frankly been um, the, the, you know, the blood, the sin, the bone and the sinew that have hold some, held some of these communities together. So many of them now have gone out of business by the, by the hundreds and thousands. Reporters have lost their jobs by the tens of thousands. Um, it's, uh, it's a, it's a bleak uh, battlefield out there. And, um, and what that means is that people don't know in so many, yes, if you live in a big city, if you're in New York or Washington, Los Angeles, Houston, Atlanta, 
there, there's some semblance of a news organization there and in some cities more than others. But if you live in a small city or a rural area, unless you've got um, you know, somebody who's just decided they're gonna stick it out and not worry about losing money, um, you don't know what's going on in the school board meeting. You're not hearing uh, about court cases in your community. You're not learning about environmental issues. I mean, there are just so many things that are not being reported now. And Marty, I'd love to have you talk about it as you perceive it. I wanna add one thing here though. Trust in the press is partly your local press. You know, you know if there's a, somebody lived or died or if there's an opening of a school who won a ball game and so forth in your community. So trust in the press used to at least partly mean your local paper. Now those local papers, so many of them died as well as they're not covering the thing you're talking about. Marty, could you describe that, discuss that a little? And also, I wonder if you could focus on what's happening in Massachusetts, which is where you are living, not at this moment, but, it, but it's where you live and where there's a plague on these local publications. Sure. Um, well, Judy's right. I mean, one of, the, one of the factors has been just the lack of income from subscribers who felt they could get information uh, for free. The biggest impact really has been on the advertising side uh, because uh, they've lost, they lost all their uh, classified advertising initially to Craigslist. Um, and, um, and of course, Craig Newmark has been a big supporter of journalism uh, since then, which is great. And I, I really admire his, his commitment to that um, and I'm grateful for it. Um, uh, but also they lost it to Google. They lost it, they lost it to Facebook. Uh, those are the outfits that sucked up all the advertising. Uh, Amazon too, by the way. Um, uh, the large tech companies have essentially sucked up all the advertising and they've denied these, inst these local institutions the money they need in order to, in order to function. Um, and also, um, so that, that has been, been the, the, the damage in terms of financially to them. Uh, the loss to the community is tremendous. I mean, the reality is that when people talk about trust in the press, they're often talking about institutions, the big ones. Uh, but really, if you look at trust in the press at the local level, there is a high level of trust and tends to be in, in local television and local newspapers. Uh, it's a very, it's a, a generally a different picture, particularly as you get to smaller and smaller communities, there's a high level of trust. And that's the foundation. Uh, that's really the foundation of democracy is that people really need to know. Um, I mean, democracy really begins at the local level. Uh, people need to know, as Judy said, what, what's happening in their school board, what's happening with the local environment, what's happening with the police. And by the way, those local stories, they're not just local, they're national as well. Um, what's happening with police is just a classic example of that. Um, if, you know, if uh, there is abuse on the part of the police, then that's probably a national story because it's occurring with police departments across the country. If there's a local environmental uh, disaster, there's a very good chance. Let's, say, let's talk about lead in the water. Uh, uh, then that is a national story because that is happening in communities around the country. And the fewer local news organizations that, are, uh, that there are, the less attention is paid to those local stories and the less that we know at the, and then the less we know at the national level, because a lot of the national institutions, um, we would read those local uh, newspapers to see what's really happening at the local level and see if there was a national story involved. One of the things at one point I want to get to a little bit is solutions, and I will talk more about the problems in a minute, but what are the solutions to this issue, to the loss of local press? And we, the three of us talked about this a little bit earlier, but should there be, you know, Judy, you're partly funded by the government. Should there be some, Voice of America, which I used to run, is funded entirely by the government. Should BBC is funded entirely by the government. So there's some brand names that are funded in part or in a whole by the government. Should there be more government support? Should Google and, and Amazon and Facebook be forced to disgorge some of their profits to help to fund the press. Do you guys have any views on that? Well, those are all really, really important questions and it's two separate ones about whether the government, government funding and then versus um, more restrictions on the Googles and, Am and others um, and Facebook. Um, in terms of the government, I think, you know, I, I don't think there's a need for more government funding um, and, and by the way, the, to the extent the government funds a corporation for public broadcasting, which then does uh, fund to an extent, both uh, national public radio, radio and television. 
um, there is no, absolutely no uh, role that, that they play, the government plays in anything we do. I mean, we are completely independent, um, but it, it is the case that part of our budget is covered uh, by government funding. Um, the percentage is less than what it used to be, um, but, but we depend enormously on individual donors, on foundations, to some extent on corporations, just as uh, the uh, commercial news organization news organizations too. So I don't, I, I would not be in favor of greater government support. I'd like to think that we could completely live without it at this point. We're not there yet, but, um, but it's, it is a hands-off proposition. And I'll just say quickly in terms of, um, uh, you know, whether the Googles of the world and the Facebooks should in some way pay back uh, to news organizations, all that news that they've sucked up, to, to use Marty's term, I think that's something that you know we need to look at. It is being looked at, and you know the question is how do you do it fairly, you know, and, and they are doing it in some ways on their own. But the question is, should there be a more systematic way of doing it? One of the questions we have is from John, who wants to know. Really, I think it's a question a lot of people wonder about. To what extent is the this animosity toward the news or the distrust of the news fed by Fox News, or maybe other things too in that uh, end of the spectrum. Uh, but, you know, you see what uh, Chris Wallace said when he moved over to CNN Plus or whatever it is, that somehow he felt that Fox had even changed post the 2020 election. But do you think there is a, uh, and, and is there an equivalency between the Fox News and say MSNBC or something, or is Fox News kind of idiosyncratic and, and, and is it damaging? Well, yeah, I mean, I think Fox News has a lot to do with it. You know, that's their shtick. Uh, their shtick is to say that everybody else is biased. I mean, they came up with that brilliant motto actually saying fair and balanced as if they were fair and balanced and everybody else wasn't. It was a genius, a genius move there by Roger Ailes. Um, the late Roger Ailes, and and so um, and that, and every night, all night, uh, at least during the sort of the peak news hours, um, where they have their so-called commentators on, uh, they're trashing they're trashing the press. So yeah, I think that has a lot to do with it. I mean, look, you know, when you look at trust, the reality is that uh, you have to go down a little bit deeper rather than the sort of top line number. Uh, if you ask Republicans who they trust, they have a lot of trust in Fox News. Uh, a tremendous amount of trust in Fox News. They just don't trust everybody else. Um, and um, if you ask, if you talk to Democrats, well, they have a, quite a bit of trust in uh, the, the New York Times, the Post, and NPR, PBS, uh, CNN, all of those. Uh, but but they don't trust Fox News at all. Uh, so, um, uh, but of course, when you're being bashed day in and day out um, by people who whose ideology you happen to share. Um, then, uh, yeah, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt our uh, image, no question about it. Uh, and and that what's is the role of social media in all of this? To what extent is social media driving the? And you mentioned a little bit before, Marty, but to, and you, you know, Judy also. How, how much is social media leading to the distrust and even hatred of the press? Well, it amplifies it because um, mm -hmm. you know, with the push of a of a or the click of a mouse or touch of a thumb on your device, you can express your opinion and it, it amplifies whatever is out there. It's very easy to do. It's often anonymous. Um, you can just you know, make up a name and you're on Twitter or I guess Facebook's a little different, but you, you have an identity and you can weigh in and um, again, amplify whatever's out there. Um, I think social media has, has has, there's no question about it. It's made it easier to attack the press, uh, but that's not the whole story of social media. Social media is also, you know, and there are some good things about social media. It's allowed more people to participate in some ways in observing and even uh, providing information um, in, 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 um, in frankly helping journalism. Um, the but, but it's not vetted and we have to, you know, it, it, it comes down to vetting, you know, where'd you get the information? How do you know this? Who's the source? Why do you trust them? Um, so I'm not ready to just completely trash social media. 
Uh, but I think there's just no question that it's amplified some of the worst, uh, worst things that have happened. And how do you feel about deplatforming the people? Uh, maybe you could have this, Marty. Should people be deplatformed, or like Robert F. Kennedy Jr., who is not on Instagram anymore, he's not on YouTube? Should that be done? What should the standards be for these social media companies to make those decisions? Honestly, I don't know uh, uh, what those standards should be. Uh, I mean, I think obviously if somebody is disseminating absolute falsehoods time and time again, um, you know, I think the, the social media companies, which have taken all taken so much revenue and which who bore no responsibility for what was on their platforms, it's about time they bore some responsibility in the same way that Judy takes responsibility what's what's on her program and I took responsibility for what's in the in the Washington Post. I would add on on social media, um, some of this is self inflicted uh, that there are a lot of journalists who are on very active on social media, which I think is fine to some degree. Uh, but I think people have gone over the line um, in uh, a lot of instances in expressing their own uh, their own personal views, um, and um, and in many instances that's in violation of the standards that their organizations have had. Could you talk uh, about your standards for a minute at the, at the post? Because I, I when you it, it seems like uh, people are rewarded on Twitter certainly, and maybe these other things for being a little snarky. But once yeah. you're a little snarky, you're taking a position you might not take as the reporter covering the story. What, what was your standard of that post? My standard personally was I went cold turkey off Twitter about three and a half years ago, and I scarcely look at it today uh, because I think it's, um, it's a sewer for the most part. Um, and there's a lot of good stuff, as Judy mentioned. I mean, there are real experts on there, who are, particularly on Ukraine now, who are saying who have some really interesting things to say. There are experts on there. But a lot of it is just uh, people mouthing off, uh, and some of the people the mouthing off. About what reporters at the post could could. Yeah, do. the standard. The, the standard. Well, we had our ethics guidelines, which were long-standing uh, guidelines on on reporters' behavior that they're supposed to limit expression of their own personal views. That's the synthesis of the of the policy, and um, and so and not everybody abides by that. Not everybody abides by that policy. Look, the New York Times, the editor of the New York Times, just put out a. Uh, a memo the other day to his staff on on social media it covered a lot of different aspects of it the use of social media but he reminded people that they had to abide by the ethics standards of the of the New York Times and um, the reason that one issues a reminder is because people apparently need to be reminded and um, and I think that's certainly true that people do need to be reminded of that and I think that people should be much more careful uh, I think to the extent that people go on social media, and are expressing their personal views, uh, political and otherwise, uh, it has the effect of undermining undermining confidence in the press. Judy, what are your sta the standards of PBS and, and what happens there? It, it's in general, it's what Marty described at the Post. We're not supposed to express, obviously, ever, um, Twitter or any other platform, public forum, what our personal views are. We are there as reporters uh, to do some analysis and observing, uh, but it's a I mean, I'll say it's a slippery slope. It's very hard. I mean, what's the difference between, I mean, even the fact that we commented on something President Biden said or before him, former President Trump, I mean, we're, we're, we're saying something about, we think that's significant. Why did we pick that comment to repeat or to retweet? Um, so everything you do on, on, you know, on Twitter, especially on Twitter, um, is a statement. You're making a statement. Um, I use Twitter primarily to promote the work of the News Hour. To 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 uh, to say, you know, we did a story tonight on alopecia, for example. Or here here's our reporting. Here's who was on our program tonight uh, to to talk about Ukraine, and here's what they said. Um, but um, but it's very easy to to slip into uh, commentary, uh, and we have to be really careful about it. We have some questions about law here. One of them is about Section 230, the Communications Decency Act, which Andrew asked about, which is the one that um, uh, kind of leaves the, uh, almost takes away from these platforms. So legal responsibility of the kind you would have at the Post, for example, Marty. And the uh, other was is about the Fairness Doctrine, whether it should be reinstated. Do either of you have views of that, either of those issues? I think Section 230 is really complicated. 
Uh, I think a lot of people have simplistic answers like repeal it. Um, I think that that uh, basically you're asking for the end of uh, comments. You're asking for the end of Facebook and Twitter. Uh, that's fine if that's what you believe. Uh, but if they had to be responsible for every single thing everybody said, uh, you've got a real problem there. Um, so, um, and the same would be true for comments on, on news sites and what have you. So I think it's much more complicated than that. Uh, what I would like to see, uh, I think what I would like to see is much more attention paid to the kind of data that tech companies are allowed to collect on individuals. That's what's allowed people to target um, uh, people for political purposes, to know exactly who they're trying to reach and what kind of message they would like to receive. Um, and um, uh, obviously there are commercial benefits of that because advertisers can target those people as well because they know exactly what your interests are. Uh, you know, commercial enterprises know a lot more about you than the government does. Um, they know virtually everything. Um, they're talk about sucking up data. They're, they're sucking up a lot of data. They're not only sucking up revenue, they're sucking up data. And the reason they've got so much revenue is because they can offer to advertisers targeting. And so they have powerful tools for that. So I think more attention should be paid to um, how much data uh, commercial enterprises can collect on uh, American citizens, American people who live in the United States or around the world. Privacy laws a little bit more like they have in Europe. Uh, Judy, yeah. any feelings about those laws, including the fairness doctrine, which you once knew? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'm i not going to weigh in on, on these things other than to say I would hope that we journalists uh, can find our, our, our way to be fair as we cover. I mean, I think of a political campaign and I think about the fairness doctrine and I, I hope that, you know, if we are doing our job, we're going to cover it fairly. We're going to, uh, but, but I'll tell you, it's not always easy. If you've got 15 people running for governor or president, are you going to give equal time to all 15 or 20 um, or equal space? Um, how, how do you do that? And so you end up making judgment calls. Uh, I'd like to think that we journalists can be driven by our own, you know, a sense of fairness, our own code of ethics, if you will, um, for some people, that's not going to be enough or good enough. Um, but I, I would rather see journalists policing ourselves than having the government pass laws. Uh, in, a, in a second, I want to ask you guys if, for solutions, for hope, for what are some things that could happen. But I want to read a last question here from Henry Weinstein, who you probably both know, terrific journalist himself, probably worked for you one time uh, uh, or with you, uh, Marty, at the LA Times. Uh, with, yeah, with. With you. He's who, great. Point out that in, in Eric Bollard, the media critic's last column, he wrote that there is a glaring disconnect, who died recently, just within the last few days, that there's a glaring disconnect between reality and how the press depicts White House accomplishments. And he argued that it seems that the press is determined to keep Biden pinned down. Uh, do you guys have any view of that? Let's leave aside the uh, everybody's equal side of things. But is there any truth, do you think, to that concern that the press? for whatever reason, doesn't want Biden's accomplishments to be fully celebrated? I, I, I mean, Marty could weigh in too. I certainly don't think that. I mean, I think, I think the press is holding him to account as we do every president. There are mistakes made. There are some, I think there's, there's sometimes a, um, on the part of the press, um, uh, you know, the, what we call the PAC mentality where People get together and they kind of are all running in the same direction on a story and and um, you know and and we sort of cease to be thinking independently about it but um, by and large I don't see a ganging up on at all on, on Joe Biden I think the reporters are trying to hold him hold him accountable I think some of the news organizations we've been discussing this hour may not be falling into that category of wanting to you know, be fair, but in general, I think the press is trying to be fair. Marty, any comments? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, I generally agree. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, people feel, the press always feels that the president of the United States should be held accountable. Uh, that's our job, is to hold power to account. That's why we have a First Amendment in this country, by the way. Uh, that's why James Madison authored it uh, as the primary author, is that he felt that power should be held to account, particularly government power. Um, so um, um, at the same time, I mean, I think with regard to the economy, 
you know, I mean, I think generally the economy has a lot of good things going on and it has a lot of uh, some bad things going on. Uh, the bad things generally fall into the category of inflation um, and uh, which is at a very, very high level at the moment, uh, driven a lot by um, gasoline and by food. Um, and, uh, but employment levels are, have rebounded really impressively. It's been a very fast rebound. Um, and, uh, and wages are up. Now the wages aren't necessarily keeping up with the inflation rate, that's the problem. So it's a complicated picture. And I think probably the, the press general, I hate to speak of the media overall because I always hated that myself uh, because we're not all the same. Uh, but I think that generally we can, you know, press can do a, um, can, it should work at trying to, to explain the complexities in the economy today. Uh, that there are some very positive signs, but there are also some uh, negative ones and explain why that is and what is, dri what is driving inflation. I mean, if we go back and look at the worker shortages. The worker shortages have, have in many instances diminished. A lot of that was, was very much related to the pandemic and, and dislocations as a result of the pandemic. Um, some of that is begin a lot of that is beginning to subside uh, and it worked itself out. Some of the supply chain stuff. I mean, nobody even used the term supply chain commonly before <laughs> recently, uh, but a lot of that was caused by the pandemic as well. Some of that has begun to subside, but you know we've got we've got some we've got some serious issues, and so I think that the press needs to explain this in all its complexity, um, and not just take one piece of it and only emphasize that. Which would, so. I want to spend a couple of minutes yeah. with you two talking about whether there's some whether there's some solutions whether there's hope, I suppose we're all hopeful people. That's what we're, you know, like, um, optimists in certain ways. Is there benefits in more transparency, uh, teaching of media literacy, ombudsman? Um, are there any things that strike either one of you as things that you think actually could, in a positive way, uh, get us through this period? Well, I would just pick up on, frankly, what Marty just said about transparency. I think the more transparent we can be, the more we can take time to explain complicated stories and to show, to the extent we can, we don't want to bore people to death, but to show them the process that we go through uh, to do a, a complicated story. I know sometimes the Post and other news organizations will say, you know, 15 reporters worked on this story. They put all the names in the byline. And so, you know, a lot of people spent a lot of time or, or they'll say we interviewed 67 people uh, in the course of reporting on this story. The more we can just add a, some transparency to, to how we do our work, the amount of time we spent, the, the pages of, of documents that were looked at uh, carefully, the number of people who were contacted by phone, email, et cetera. I think that that, that helps to some extent. Um, it's not gonna change public, the public's view overnight. I don't believe that, but I think, I just think more reporting, more facts, more digging, more transparency, all of the above are the kinds of things that are gonna keep the press strong. We have to keep doing the job that we do. We can't give up, get discouraged and, you know, say goodbye. I'm, I'm uh, you know, I'm, I, you know, the, the public, we, we're never going to win back the trust of the public. It's true. Some people will, you know, will never trust the press, but we can't give up. We have to keep reporting. It's too important. Before I turn to Marty for some comments on this, just let me say that one place we're seeing that kind of transparency, if that's the right word for it, is the reporting on Ukraine where the press is telling you how they verified the pictures that they had, the accuracy of the stories they're running, which I think has been extremely interesting. And I don't remember seeing much of that before, but it's, it's there all the time now. Marty, any thoughts about? I just want to say quickly before you go to Marty, the NewsHour had a piece tonight on what we call open source intelligence, a lot of which is collecting people collecting information uh, and pulling it together after verifying it. Go ahead, Marty. No, I think that's, and I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. I think that's a, a really important thing uh, generally. Marty, your thoughts? Yeah, uh, it's a complicated question. I mean, I think there are probably, I would mention two things, uh, I guess. One is, um, 
uh, gets to what you were just talking about, and that is, I think we need to we need to approach our stories in a way as if we were as if we were a lawyer in a court. Uh, we need to present the evidence. We need to show all the evidence. We need to show the video that we were referring to in context. If there's a court document, we need to show the court document, annotate it, point people in context to exactly what we were referring to. If there's data coming from the government. We need to link to that study, to that, that report, and annotate where we found that data. Uh, the more we can do that, uh, the, the, the stronger the story becomes. With the internet, we, and we have all the tools available to us to do that. Uh, and we should be doing it um, uh, routinely uh, and rigorously. Uh, and we're not. Uh, we do it sometimes. We do it on these big projects. Uh, but we need to do it in almost every story that we do. It takes a lot of work. Um, but, um, but I think that's where, we need to, that's where we need to go. The final thing that I would mention is that I just think we as a profession uh, need, to, um, uh, need to be more in the listening mode and less in the talking mode. Uh, with cable news, you've got a lot of talking, people talking at you. They're all very opinionated. Uh, they all know the answers. Um, I believe that the, the fundamental role of journalism is to go seeking the answers. Uh, we don't start knowing by knowing the answers. We go seeking the answers. Uh, when, we've, when we've done the research, when we've done all that work, we should tell people very honestly, straightforwardly, and unflinchingly what it is we found, uh, and no beating around the bush. But first, we need to do all of that research. And so I think that we, um, I always, I've always said, when people ask me what I'm looking for and journalists that I would hire, I said, I'm looking for journalists who are more impressed with what they don't know than with what they do know or think they know. Uh, that's what I'm looking, looking for among a number of other qualities. Uh, and so as a profession, I think we could, uh, we could show uh, some more humility. I couldn't agree more. I think we need more humility in the press. We don't have all the answers uh, and it's hurt us to the extent the public thinks we act like we do. Well, maybe those are hopeful thoughts to end on uh, along with the, maybe the, the thought that some really great reporting, which um, uh, Sam pointed out just now that uh, the video and print stories about Ukraine have been extraordinary. And I think when you see great reporting, maybe that's part of what also uh, builds more faith in the, in the press too. Uh, and and, and, and reporting that really is proved to be, to be true. But on the, all, on the other hand, we didn't know. Nobody seemed to know either how strong Ukraine would be or how weak the Russian forces were. Any last comments from either of you before we uh, close this out? Marty, Judy? Go ahead, Judy. Yeah, I was just going to say, I think it, I guess I'm repeating what I said a minute ago. I think it's really important that the press just keeps at it, that we keep reporting, we keep doing the work, we keep digging, we keep turning over facts, as Marty said, that we keep um, we look for the evidence, we share what we know, um, more transparency. I think, you know, we're not going to change people's views overnight. We have to, we just keep slogging at, away at it. Um, and, and, and that's how we best serve the American people. Thank you. Yeah, I would say, well, two things. One, first of all, it's an honor to be on with uh, you and Judy. I appreciate that. So it's uh, really great. Um, you know, when you retire, you think you're just going to be forgotten. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for not forgetting me. Um, that's really nice. Uh, secondly, I mean, I just think that um, I think one of the lessons out of uh, the war in Ukraine is what's happening in Russia um, with the elimination of uh, any independent press, as little as they had at that time. Uh, at the beginning of the war, they have virtually nothing left. Um, I think that that should cause Americans to think about the role of the press in this country. Uh, and it's essential for all of our faults. And we have many. Uh, we're highly imperfect um, uh, because we're human. Uh, but for all of our faults, um, if you don't have a free press, you will not have a democracy. It is never there has never been such a democracy without a free press when when uh, when people uh, tend to move away from democracy toward authoritarianism. The first thing they do is they go after the press um, and to suppress it and eliminate it. We're seeing that, we've seen that in Russia today. And I think we have to be very much on guard in this country to make sure that we don't even begin to move in that direction. Once, okay. it gets, once, it gets, once you start moving in that direction, it can be very difficult to stop. There may be no such thing as, as perfection, but I'd say that uh, Judy Ruff, Marty Barron, 
come as close to it as there is in the journalism profession. Thank you both so much for being part of this fascinating conversation. Thank you for having me. Having and, it. Thank and you. I, I will have to make the, I, it comes to me to make an announcement about next week just to remind people to tune in on Wednesday, uh, April 20th at 5 p.m. Pacific when the guests are going to be, and you see it on the screen there, Lieutenant Governor uh, Colonel Alex Vindman, who's going to be interviewed by KCOW's Warren Only, exploring the topic how Russia's war in Ukraine has changed the world order. Thank you all for visiting, and thanks especially to our wonderful guests.